Hi, welcome to the next in our series of Practical Electromagnetic for Engineers. Today we're going to be talking about inductors. And if you're in my class, you can follow along in section 5.7 of the text. So if you remember when we were talking about electric fields, um, we saw that capacitance related the voltage and the charge on any kind of geometrical structure made out of conductors. So essentially you have some conductor here, you have another conductor here that have charge on them. Maybe you have some dielectric material, epsilon in the middle. And capacitance essentially was the ratio of charge to voltage. And we could define it in terms of the electric field through those two integral relationships. And we also remember that if we look at moving charge, which in essence is current, we can derive our basic expression from circuits. We also saw that resistance was another way to relate current and voltage through the conductivity of the material. We have some kind of uh, chunk of material here that has a conductivity sigma. Let's actually write the sigma over there. You saw that the voltage to the current was given by this integral expression. And both of these expressions for the resistance and also for the capacitance allow you to calculate a distributed property of either capacitance or resistance. In other words, we're not calculating the value of a particular capacitor. But any kind of conducting structure has both resistance and capacitance to it, and it's actually a geometrical property distributed over the structure itself. Now, it turns out there's a similar property of circuits or of any kind of conducting structure called inductance, and the inductance relates the current and the magnetic flux of the structure. And so essentially we write it like this, inductance, which we use the letter L to represent, is given by the magnetic flux divided by the current. This capital P here is the magnetic flux, and remember flux is simply the amount of magnetic field vectors through a surface, so we know that the current flowing is going to basically, let's make sure I get this the right way, current's basically flowing that way, so my magnetic field is going to go that way. So essentially, remember, we're going to have some magnetic fields generated by this loop of wire that are going to go up and under around that way. We can also calculate the current by a separate integral expression, which is basically um, given right here. And in this case, the integrals are, of course, done in different places. We're talking about the current flowing through the wire and the magnetic field through the loop of the circuit. But when we calculate those, um, we can come up, if we know the magnetic field, uh, of the of the inductance, just like we did for the capacitance and the resistance. So what's the point of all of this? It turns out, just like capacitance and resistance, inductance is a fundamental property of any kind of conducting structure. It depends on the geometry. Different geometries are going to have different inductances. Now, it may not seem to make a whole lot of sense to calculate the magnetic flux through a loop of the, of the conducting structure because we rarely deal with magnetic fluxes when we're doing basic circuit stuff. But you remember Faraday's law, which we talked about before, relates the change of the magnetic flux with time to the voltage. Um, by these relationships right here, you can see this integral is essentially exactly the same as the integral that appears right here, where we're writing V is mu h. And thus we come up with our circuit relationship that the um, voltage is given by the inductance times the time rate of change of current, and this relates inductors back to basic circuit properties. So in every single case, the capacitance, the resistance, the inductance, we're talking about a fundamental property of any conducting structure, and these fundamental properties give relations between the voltage and the current. Now, just as we did with capacitors and inductors, a lot of times we want to make a structure that either has a very big inductance or we want to control the inductance accurately so we can make an inductor of a particular size. The most common way of doing this is as shown here, but it's not a very good drawing, and I apologize for that, is simply to wrap a bunch of, of coils of wire together. So take a wire and wrap it around in a big loop so that the flux created by the current in one of these is going to go through multiple wires. So you're essentially going to get lots and lots of flux going around those wires, all coupling to one another. This is going to give you a very large value of L because you have a high flux coupling in the numerator of that expression right there. And so you use multiple turns to capture flux. Um, your inductance depends on the number of turns you have, and so it allows you to control inductance very accurately. If you need to make even bigger inductors, you do this down here, and you put a material with a very high permeability. Remember, high permeability materials concentrate the magnetic flux so you're going to get a whole lot of the, more of the flux rays that, rather than going outside this structure, flow up through the structure 
and that's going to give you a bigger inductance, usually by about a factor of 10 compared to an air-wound coil. And there are some analytic expressions for inductance. We can look at a long solenoid and find it has an inductance given by this expression right here, where A is the area of the solenoid, N is the number of turns, L is the length, and mu is whatever material you put inside there. You use mu naught if it's an air-wound solenoid. But this equation only holds if the length of the solenoid is much, much greater than di the diameter. For a shorter coil um, without anything inside it, we call it an air coil, uh, this expression gives the inductance in microhenries. And so you've got to remember this expression is for microhenries, where essentially D is the diameter of the coil, N is the number of turns, and L is the length of the coil. Similarly, if you go to most electromagnetics textbooks or radio amateur handbooks, you can find lots of formulas for inductance. This is the inductance of a coaxial cable, where A and B are the inner and outer diameters of the wires, respectively. And this is the uh, formula for the inductance of a single piece of straight wire. And in this case, I believe the inductance is given in nanohenries rather than microhenries. Just like with capacitance, you don't always want to have inductance um, within a circuit. Let's take a look at an example here. Let's say we have a circuit and we're only looking at part of it. It's actually a larger circuit, maybe a bigger loop, and we're looking at a cross-section of two of the wires, wire number one here and wire number two. Um, if we have an external magnetic field or magnetic flux that goes through the area between these wires, um, this is going to couple noise onto the circuit if the magnetic field is changing in time. And this is really, really common from um, AC electrical devices operating at 60 hertz, at least in the United States, 50 hertz in other parts of the world. Let's say you've got a transformer or a fair amount of uh, current going through some power line. That can create fairly strong magnetic fields that can introduce noise into circuits, um, especially if you have a long run of wire. So 60 hertz noise or 50 hertz noise is a real problem. Um, for sensitive circuits. One way, of course, you can get rid of this is simply to reduce the area between the wires by bringing the wires closer together, as shown in the figure over here. This reduces the area flux will couple into, so it can reduce the inductive coupling. Unfortunately, when you do that by bringing the wires closer together, you can increase capacitive coupling between the two wires, which isn't always desirable. If you have to have really long runs of wire in noisy areas, one way to do it is something called a twisted pair. This is essentially taking two wires and twisting them together. And the general idea behind this is, is I'm going to sort of draw these two wires as a bunch of loops. And if we have the flux um, coming up this way through the loop, it's going to essentially induce a voltage. And essentially, you're going to you know, think about the right-hand rule. It's going to go counterclockwise. If we then take this wire and put a half twist in it, in other words, we don't twist it a full 360 degrees, but we rotate 180 degrees, or pi radians, you can see if the flux comes up this way through the wire, um, because we've twisted it upside down, the voltage induced actually is going to go the opposite direction. In other words, well, the voltage is really going to be induced the same way, but that half twist makes the voltage flow in the opposite direction. And so the voltage from segment 1 and segment 2 are going to cancel out. We put another 180 degree twist in here. So we've basically twisted 360 degrees, we're back to segment one, another one back to segment two, and you can see that over a long length what's going to happen is any kind of induced voltage is going to cancel out. And in fact, this is done very, very commonly in things like Ethernet cables. If you've ever opened up one of your Ethernet cables, you'll see there's sort of four wire pairs that are twisted inside. And if you look carefully, um, you can see that this pair of wires, the orange one, has sort of the the longest twist radius. They're, they're not twisted as nearly as tightly as the green wires here. And they've actually designed internet cables very, very carefully um, to minimize any kind of coupling between the wires by choosing different twist radii. The next thing we're going to say about inductance is something called mutual inductance. Because you get inductance any time you couple magnetic flux into the loop of a circuit, um, it turns out that the magnetic flux created by one circuit can couple into another circuit and this is called mutual inductance because it's the inductance the inductive coupling between two different circuits um, this can be a problem with noise but most often we think about this in terms of things like transformers a transformer essentially is a device that's designed to couple a lot of magnetic flux from one coil of wire let's call it coil number one down here into a second coil of wire 
coil two up here. And the reason transformers are useful, and there are a lot of reasons they're useful, but one of the main reasons they're useful is coil number one, let's say it has in one turns of wire, and coil number two has in two turns of wire. It turns out the voltage induced on um, coil two by coil one is given by the relative ratio of their turns as shown here. So by changing the number of coils, we can either make the voltage higher or lower by putting an AC voltage in, in coil number one and coupling it out of coil two. Similarly, there's an inverse relationship between the current and the voltage and the number of turns as shown here. And so we can make a current step up or step down transform. And notice you can't step up both the voltage and the current because the power has to be conserved. You can't basically have a transformer that gives you more power. Nevertheless, Transformers are very useful devices. They run on mutual inductance.